Hello, I'm David Eicholtz with David Richard Gallery here in New York City. And today I am visiting Isaac Aiden, who's standing in front of me. Wave, Isaac. <laughs> um, this is uh, Sunday, December 27th, and uh, I'm at Isaac's studio up in Harlem in New York. And Isaac had an exhibition with the gallery in September and October, um, which was a spectacular uh, exhibition of these very ethereal, color field like paintings. And we did a, a lot of detailed videos in the gallery discussing those. And I'm just going to pan a few of them right now. I just sort of give you a little bit of background about what we're doing. Um, and that work pretty much was done through the uh, pandemic, through the, mostly the shutdowns. And so that was the, the exhibition that we had, and we had lots of discussion about it because these paintings are much more complex um, in terms of um, the intellectual underpinning for them as well as um, the, the references and the uh, historical, art historical inspirations. So after that show, Isaac continued producing most of what we're seeing here, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview. I'm just going to pan this other room real quick so you can see. Uh, nice studio. But anyway, there's a, a number of different things that uh, Isaac was exploring um, after the exhibition. Um, it inspired him to con continue to look at these uh, paintings in this process and, and um, in a number of different ways. So what we would like to do today is capture some of that. And we'll reference back. You guys can, anyone who's watching this can always go back to the gallery website and take a look at the, um, the videos that we did that were quite detailed. We also had a number of critics write about the work and um, like David Carrier. And those um, reviews are also on there along with a lot of the writing that the gallery did for the show. So what I'd like to do is, Isaac, let's start in that front room sure. and let's have you talk about what's different about these from um, the ones that were in the exhibition. And I'd like to start with this grouping right here, which are very saturated in terms of color. And they are evocative of one of the paintings that was in the show that had a little bit more, I think, of the dark purple at the top. It was sort of a variation of these. But talk a little bit more about what inspired you to go back now and do like this little mini version of them. So one thing that I, uh, I did with the paintings was um, when I first started doing them, I liked to do them in pairs a lot of times. So there was always uh, a tendency in my practice to try to replicate quite closely another painting. These are two that are very close. And um, what I found interesting was that it, was, it, was, it wasn't it was impossible, but it, it started becoming more and more apparent to me the subtlety, which is something that I really like in the work. And, uh, so were you, were you striving though for replication? Because as you said that, that's sort of the first time I've really heard you utter it exactly that way. It sounds very Andy Warhol-ish. No, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't say replication, like mechanical replication. But I, I liked the I liked the pairing of two paintings, the same as Joe Barrow had two paintings. But my there. point with that comment though was yes, he was trying to do it through lithography and other you know replicative uh, methods. But um, even just trying to repeat your process in a way to, to duplicate. So what I was curious about is, were you trying to duplicate the painting, or were you just sort of exploring how you did the original one and letting a sort of um, happy accident, if you will? sort of guide you into a different direction? I, I would say the latter to a degree. I mean, I, on occasion, have a general idea of what I was going to do with the okay. when I started. But really what I found was these, to me, were more successful in volume. The more paintings I did, the more successful they were. The faster that I did them and the closer I did them together, the more successful they were. I would liken it to doing music practicing music or dance because it really becomes a bodily thing where then you remember the subtle nuance that's, I'm not gonna go into all the like, my new show, how I make them. But basically to answer your question about these very vivid, very saturated ones, 
the, the kind of purple on the top is really in painting mixing just between blue, actually very vivid blue, and this, you know, red, and actually yellow. You don't really realize it, but the yellow is kind of what does it. Well, that's the other thing, too, with these, we should refresh people's memories, that basically these are red, blue, yellow. Yeah, these are made with primary colors. And they're also... Um, What's interesting about this series, and, you're, and also we are going to get to a table that was in there I didn't pan right now, um, of uh, sort of the what led up to this work. It's, these are some studies and things that Isaac had done that sort of led up to this. But the interesting thing about this series was he, um, you, you, you laid down wet paint and it was gray, and then these were sprayed very rapidly on top of that wet gray paint. And sometimes the grays were real dark gray, sometimes they were lighter gray, but it was basically to allow a mixing of the paint so it's wet on, it was wet on wet. And these weren't brushed or anything, they just, it's how the particulate fell and, and adhered to the wet paint, that was the painting, correct? I'm painting spray into oil paint like the kind that they would do a classical oil painting with. And so it's not brushed to spray, but the ground, the oil ground is brushed. And I'm just sort of zooming in because the gray is often um, very noticeable uh, uh, and distinct on the sides of the paintings. So you can see and also some of the spray residue. So a lot of them I like the subtlety in the gray. So with these I had May also I'm doing them outside. Um, so the weather does affect them. So the painting that they was mentioning I did in the summer. And so when it's very hot, then it definitely has an impact on the work. These, you know, it's, it's a 2020 now, and I have been starting with David said as 2016. I think Obama was still, yeah, he was still president um, when I first started developing this body of work. And so these particular ones, what I was doing was I was trying to make a very saturated painting that then I was gonna overlay with white because it was like a snowstorm. So I wanted a very vivid, very saturated base and then almost like a speck or something, the color would kind of come through. But then as I was doing it, I was like, boy, oh, that looks really good, maybe that should just be finished. And so what happens as I'm doing these, a lot of times, um, if I'll let the painting evolve in a kind of modernist fashion, if I feel like the painting is finished, if I like how it looks, I try to stop. And then if I have an idea of another place that I might go, I'll try to do a different one and try to do that again. But, um, you know, some of them, they're, 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 there could be many paintings underneath that's happening at an extremely fast pace. Like, like very, very fast. But I've, I've found that they're probably better if the painting is going in a direction to just let it happen. And it's a bit more of a modernist approach, I would say. And this is a little bit different, because um, your exhibitions typically, and we debated about this, because the exhibition you were going to do in the gallery was going to be one of your exhibitions where um, you have a number of both painting and sculptural elements, and there's a, a very conceptual underpinning, and it really becomes an installation. I mean, they are independent objects, but the way you conceive them and put it together <coughs> is... Um, very much an installation and it tells a story. There's a, there's a very complex story. So we can look at the storyboard of that because I know you still, I noticed you still have it tacked up on your wall. But um, my, my point was being though is that in many ways this is a, a bit of a departure from what you had planned to do. And as people can see right now, we're looking at some of these paintings as they were conceived of as just short, as, as small studies here. Um, how he was going to do this and then incorporate other sculptural elements. But in many ways, you are still kind of embarking on the same complexity of your process, but what you're doing is, instead of different objects, where it's maybe just the two, you know, goat uh, statues with this, this was actually going to be a, a big, um, like wrestling arena yeah. that you had, had planned to do, but that was going to be just an object. And then this was another object that you had. There was a sculpture on a metal that you had. Um, and then these statues. But instead what you're doing is you are getting a complexity of individual, ind independent attempts with a constraint you've imposed in terms of size and the trio of colors, red, blue, and yellow in your process. 
which is a wet on wet, a spray on a wet uh, ground. So in many ways, you're still working the same way. It's just the aesthetic is a singular aesthetic in terms of the structure of the artwork. But this tremendous complexity, I mean, there's 12 or 14 of these things in the gallery. And here's quite a few that we're, we're panning here. <laughs> And I know this, there's a stack mapped up over here. So how many of you produce of these? Would you say about maybe 50, 60? I was choosing to produce 56 for the year. That's what I got to when I did, you know, yeah. it was just this uh, five by four foot size. And then there was also some that were much larger. So to address what you were saying, um, kind of like in the beginning, I started saying I was trying to get one to kind of match the other one. And then I thought that that's what I would do and just kind of that would be one piece, and I would work as different tangential related pieces. Essentially what I'm doing is just a much deeper dive okay. into that aspect. It's sort of like these little subfamilies are emerging now. Yeah, and then, yeah. What's funny is I thought maybe I would do you know, 10 of them at most, and then I would be done with it. And then as I did them, I could see places where the body of work was gonna go. And instead of painting myself into a corner, what I found was the more work that I did, the more it evolved, and then the work yeah. led to other places. And I can easily see a minimal of another 10 this way, another yeah. 10 that way, that I haven't done yet. And I thought that surely, you know, this would be enough and I'd be done with the series. But I could see a lot of different directions that I could go. Well, I love these, um, the, the, it was this, they feel purpley, but they're, they're, you know, they were done, there was a red, blue, yellow, which is the way your what you lay down first, and then how many times you go over it, and also how close you get. Um, like here, you see the sheen is sort of shifting as you get closer to get more of the saturation of the paint. You also get a different surface effect. So there's a lot of really interesting sort of surprises um, about this process where they, within a painting, they feel there's areas that are matte and that are very sheen, high sheen or high gloss. Um, but it's also because of your wet on wet process. So you don't have the luxury of multiple light thin layers that will be, then end up giving the same surface effect. Here, you're, you're having to tease those apart as you're doing it and deciding what you're really trying to go for. Is that a fair? Oh, yeah. Which also then gets to, I guess I answered my own question then. So what ends up happening then is even if you are doing a subtle variation with the differences in that machine, you're also getting a different effect. Well, and the other thing that's you know, doing with this one, so this one. Yeah, this is a great painting. I love this. Um, having a little bit more of a gestural quality, and there was some uh, a couple of paintings in the show that remind me of um, kind of a Monet painting or almost even an impressionistic modeling. This has more of like a romantic. Uh, kind of 19th century quality, which is something I definitely am looking at, but you can see it's a little bit more... Well, it's very uh, smoky, very ethereal, or it, it can read like mist yeah. above, um, you know, a pool or a pond. Something um, that has the, the physicality of what's happening with the paint. And then when I was talking about just kind of letting it go, you know, normally as I would be doing this, I would be laying down a layer and I would continue to develop a layer. But as I looked at that, I said, well, you know what, I think, I think I'm just going to call that one done. Even though it, it has the implication of a bit more hand as well. Yes. Um, but, uh, but it's really but struggled, stunning and it's yeah. distinctly different. That's what I really like about it. I'm glad you're sort of experimenting um, with some of um, these variations. Yeah. And, and what, one of the things, you know, in, in the kind of working in an abstract vein where you know, these have you know, a reference in landscape, kind of sky landscape, is um, it, if it gets too gestural, too literal, it starts, it starts going into complete abstraction. And so that's not, that's not what I was trying to explore necessarily. But when you're doing something, you know, sometimes when a painting looks good, these are not meant to be 100% landscapes. If you right. really look at them closely, I'm not 100% trying to replicate a sky. Yeah, but you just, it's so antithetical what you just said, but it's true, I hadn't thought about it. The more you start fussing with it and doing more, more of the artist's hand becomes visible, 
you would think it would be because you're actually trying to make it more representational, but what ends up happening is it becomes more of an abstraction. By being reductive and keeping it very minimal and with a limited palette, and the fact that you lay these down, these colors end up being horizontal, they, even though the painting format is vertical, the inherent read will be landscape. Yeah. And so the more you mess around with it, the more it looks like, you know, this almost could like be the beginnings of something that like a Dan Christensen would have done with his sprays early on in the 70s and 80s, yeah. you know, which were pure abstractions. There was nothing. I love like, Dan Christensen. Yeah. He's from Nebraska. I'm from Nebraska. He's one of the few <laughs> artists from Nebraska. I forgot about that. And I actually went to his last show right before he passed away. Um, yeah, I loved his work. I actually had several of his paintings. They were great. But now this is not at all, for those of you who know dance, I mean, yeah, please. Yeah, this is, this action up here is totally different. But when I asked Isaac earlier what happened there, because a lot of times he just lets the wind, because most of these are painted outdoors, and he sort of lets the wind be a little bit of that happy accident and it kind of moves or drifts the paint so that it, it, it does have a little bit of a, a hiccup in the process, but it becomes actually a very interesting it's a mark. Send my thing, yeah. and then sometimes I'm standing there and I'm literally trying to feel the very subtle variation in the movement of the wind, right? And stopping or starting. But here, in this case, though, you said you were actually were sort of twisting and moving your yeah, hand. Which I'm I'm doing to direct the spray a little bit, but you still didn't really know quite how it was going to land or or what it was going to happen. But I love this effect that it's like mist coming off of yeah. water, even though it's yellow. Yeah. Sometimes um, it's it's also the speed because I'm fighting light going the sun going yeah. down, and I'm trying to do these very fast. And um, uh, but but basically something like that. But these are very subtle. Like you need, you need a nice. Calm, you know, the, the air pressure needs to be a certain way, and the temperature to make it nice and smooth. Yeah. So sometimes you're fighting it, and then you're trying to get to that. You say, This is wonderful. Well, there were two that we had in the exhibition that we hung as a pair, as you'll recall, um, that were sort of modeled. And, you, and I asked you about that because they looked very much like the sky, like a cloudy sky. And you said that was really the wind. It was sort of eddying and moving around and whipping around and landing very erratically, in which you probably couldn't have achieve that even if you if that's what you were trying to do and the fact that you were doing it in that courtyard where you had three walls essentially was creating like a little bit of a vortex in there and um so it was sort of throwing the color down in bursts uh, as opposed to a fine spray so no i mean i think there was quite uh your your physical situation in this gallery forced that to happen but it turned out to be fortuitous so it, it really worked out great. And then we can we can look at some of them here. The other thing that you know we are talking about the, the grouping and how they evolve, you know, about trying to work in pairs or having a limited constraint, a limited color palette and the process and just continuing with it. You know, it even in a way I think it's it's akin to like someone on Kawara who just, just stays yeah. with something. The more that you 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 find a pattern and just stay with it. So what I find because of my background security is I'm as I'm kind of looking at all of these together, it's, it's kind of a luxury to be able to spread them out and look at them. Yeah. Because which is why we're here today yeah, because it's kind of like we're shooting because yeah. a lot of times like these over here, this is what we did for the show, I'll do them and just wrap them up. Yeah. Because I don't want them to get yeah. you know dirty or damaged or something like that. And then there's still 12 or something, I forget the number, over in the gallery, also wrapped up. So yeah, there's been a lot of work. But this painting right here is sort of like a more reductive version of this trio over here. And so this, the painting I just panned, I mean, looked at before I panned over here, could actually be part of that grouping. And that's also how we curated and installed the show is we uh, did things as sort of groupings. In fact, the, the most spectacular wall was a 35-foot wall where we hung five of them. They showed a progression and they were all the same, <clears throat> sort of this warm, you know, color, uh, like this, you know, group over here, but not as saturated. So I'm thrilled to see the saturation. But there's something, and then this one is like a, a calmer version of this other amber one. Um, in fact, 
I can see sort of here in the screen, which is interesting, it allows you to see more sometimes than actually looking at the painting, which I know seems completely crazy to say. But um, in here, there's a lot of um, a subtle version of what you were doing in this painting, it yeah, seems those, like. Yeah, those two are definitely... Um, they're totally related. Yeah, they're totally so again, related. these would be a great pairing um, that would show <clears throat> a very different aspect of the, of the work. But while we're here, let's talk about these blue ones first, and then I want to jump over to this other one and talk about the fluorescence because there's more of them in the other one. So let's talk about these blue ones. You had a, a thought about these when we were chatting earlier. I, I don't remember what we were saying before, but... Um, well, something about the sublime. We were talking about the sublime, and I was... Oh, I, I'm the one that asked about this one in the center. The center is in the bottom. Yeah. Um, and that kind of implication. So, so some of these two, these are very similar to the red ones that we looked at, you know. Um, a lot of the color generally, if I was to generalize what I was interested in in this body of work, is the gray and the subtlety between it. Don't you stand over this way out of the shit, yes, yeah, so we don't get shadows. Really at, um, you know, sky, a lot of it, you know, the sublime is being between, you know, being night and then, you know, beauty kind of... And right here, this is just sheen. Just letting people know, um, because the lighting's not perfect right now. Yeah, but, but I'm just panning these for people to kind of see the variations. I wanted to do something a little bit more um, vivid and, and you know, with the blue, and so it's very similar to these uh, red and orange ones, but you know, in the, in the blue spectrum. And there's a lot of uh, subtlety that's 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 very. Uh, from the, from the perspective of being you know, a little tricky to get because the yellow, you know, fading into the blue, obviously, you know, makes green and you don't know, want this to become a green painting. Uh, but, but you are, you know, talking about this, this bottom section and how it almost feels like, you know, the, the, the sun is kind of coming up. I mean, there's aspects of it, but um, I think also it might be this one has pink, uh, a little bit of pink in it. Yeah. yeah, I see that. So on yeah. top, I added kind of also a bit more gesture. And it, it's very, really, you know, I love the subtlety in these pieces, but this is very similar to the one that, that you kind of showed the yellow that you said could right. be the quality of a, a more kind of romantic painting. And um, so uh, the the manner in which I'm, I'm doing the layering is, is something also that I'm exploring. Um, between what is you know laid down first, second, third. I mean, right. in the general, normal, classical way is you you know you like lighter colors into darks, and the other way is your you know distance into foreground. And so I found that I have different effects depending on what's you know what's on top, what's the last layer. You know, it's sort of weird <clears throat> as you just said that we we're experimenting now with the layering. <clears throat> in some ways, you <clears throat> pardon me. I sort of done this before. I'm thinking about the show up in Hudson, the gray and sort of red orange stripe. Yeah. It was the same material, you know, um, but you did them in different scale yeah. and in um, and some of them uh, in different compositions where they were more sculptural and some where they were more painting like. But there, um, it was the same stripe. It was very a la Van Buren, um, but you sewed them but they read as paintings. They were actually fabric um, that you uh, sewed together and then made your different supports and it even incorporated some, um, what am I trying to say, fluorescent yeah, lighting and yeah. stuff, neon lighting. And, um, but there again, it was the same material, but there you were playing with scale, composition, and um, basically this tension between painting and sculpture or literally, uh, you were doing paintings and you were doing sculpture, but the, the continuity of the stripe is what pulled it together. So it's the same idea here, but now you're confining yourself by a 60 by 48 inch format and um, three colors, and then it's how you lay it down, whether they're saturated, ethereal, or, you know, almost, this isn't really monochromatic, 
but there's some in the other room where they're much, much, much more subtle. And um, and others that you did at the beginning, where they were, they were, they read monochromatic, but they weren't because they always have they're, they're three colors. Very, it's just very subtle amounts yeah. of color. So these things aren't exactly the same color palette. I think it's uh, maybe a different blue, but they're essentially just yeah. more saturated versions of the same uh, same approach. But the one I'm focusing on right now is this one with this hot fluorescent in it, which we're going to move over to those on the yeah, other so side. Can, can but you around. said something I guess I had forgotten that this series or this approach. Sorry, folks. Uh, we're in New York. We're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in an old building, um, pre thermo pain. Um, so anyway, um, so this where was I going with this? this oh, this you said these started, started with fluorescent. fluorescent. Yeah. So um, we we can look at some of the drawings that, that there were actually original drawings um, that I did uh, that were painted on paper that led to the development of the series. But I was using fluorescent paint. And that's uh, the first ones I did, um, I used fluorescent paint. And then at some point, um, frankly, I, I, I didn't really see where the series was going to go. And when I moved away from just using the fluorescent paint to using you know, a, a conventional uh, regular blue palette, it, it opened up so many more colors and there was so much more well, this lavender at the top here, I've never seen that lavender. Is this yeah. the same paint, or is that fluorescent actually doing something, or is it just I think a, it might be a difference in your like layering? One different layering and one different paint. I mean, I, I use something more than just only red, and yellow, and blue, but it's variants of those colors. Like this is kind of like a, a more purplish kind of lavender. Yeah, this is absolutely spectacular. I love this one. This is, of course, you know, I, I just. I love fluorescent. It doesn't matter. It's you know, um, that's just the old hippie in me. 